So I just want to welcome welcome everybody uh, to this uh, first of hopefully several interviews. Um, my name is Spencer from Chronometer.com, and uh, you know we're here to uh, help educate you on in the very confusing world of nutrition. Um, with me today is uh, Susan McFarlane. Uh, she's a registered dietitian in uh, Ottawa, Canada, and we are going to be talking about plant-based diets. So. Um, Susan, you know, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your professional background? Sure. So as you already mentioned, I'm a registered dietitian slash nutritionist. Uh, often get asked what's the difference and it really kind of comes down to university programs. So all dietitians are nutritionists. It doesn't necessarily or it doesn't go the reverse. Uh, so I have both of those qualifications. So um, I've been a dietitian since 2011 after mm -hmm. I graduated from the University of Saskatchewan. I also hold a master's in human nutrition where I actually specialize in eating disorders and disordered eating. Um, so I've worked in many diverse community settings. Um, kind of name it, I've done it. So I worked on reserves, I worked for health centers, I worked for um, weight management clinics, I worked in grocery stores, and just recently I kind of decided, or you know, out of frustration a little bit, I felt that I didn't have all the resources and tools and time to really be doing what I wanted to do and to make the difference I wanted. So in 2017, in about March, I decided to take the full leap into private practice. So now I'm in Ottawa, which is, for anyone not in Canada, it's Canada's capital. It's absolutely beautiful here. Uh, so here I run a private practice where I specialize in plant-based eating, um, as well as I do see eating disorders, weight management, and kind of everything that I've done in the past I've taken into my practice today. Very cool. Very cool. So, you know, you you obviously follow a plant-based diet yourself, correct? Oh, I do. So, and that wasn't always the case, I assume. No. So, I have an interesting uh, kind of lead-in. So, um, my mom was vegetarian in a tiny little town. So, I always idolized her and wanted to be like her. So, I really never ate a lot of meat as, as a kid. I had, I just was very averse to it. So, never really took to it. Uh, and then as a teenager, started making that connection between the animals I like and the animals I eat, uh, decided to be vegetarian. And then in university, it was no big movement or anything. It was just some random person, I don't even know his name, uh, told me he was vegan. And I this was in like 2006. And I was like, what's a vegan? And then I opened that world and, uh, and then kind of that night went vegan. Went back and forth a little bit between vegetarian and vegan because I was in the prairies where it's very, very small, very farming community. It was 2006, so I didn't even know anyone or anyone else who was vegan. I couldn't find this one guy that I'd run into once upon a time. Um, and so then when I moved to Ottawa is when I, I fully committed to being vegan. And uh, it wasn't until I started saying, okay, well, is this actually healthy for me? that I started incorporating it into my practice because then I started actually looking at the research and being like, oh, hey, I can be healthy and it can also help with like weight loss and diabetes management and all of that as well. Very cool. So it seems like it was kind of a natural progression for you to yeah. kind of get into this industry in general, the nutrition industry. Yeah, I've always been drawn to nutrition. I was raised by a bit of a health nut, but uh, I, sure. I've also, you know, I like to dabble in the occasional junk food as well. So, yeah, it's, been, it's a natural fit and it's, uh, you know, I live what I do. So it really helps in, in terms of my practice. Awesome. Awesome. So um, I guess to start off, you know, I, I, I am not terribly familiar with uh, what makes a good plant-based diet. You know, I'm curious if you have like a a template. I know everybody's different, uh, but yeah. I'm wondering if you have a basic template that you follow if you were to describe what a healthy plant-based diet looks like. Sure. I don't have a template, but I have a checklist that uh, I go through with people. Um, so a healthy plant-based diet. So when I first went vegan back in the day, there was no different type of vegan. It was just you were vegan. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. And now what we're starting to see is that you kind of have food industry or junk food vegan and you have like whole food plant-based and you have raw diets. So you have all these like sub-genres of, of a plant-based diet. So what I promote based on what the research says is an 80% whole food plant-based diet. And I say 80% because none of us are perfect. 
Um, now that there's like vegan Ben and Jerry's, I mean, I'm not going to pass up that. So, so I say most of the time. Um, but even so with that, so that's kind of the umbrellas. I, I encourage everyone to be whole food, plant-based as much as possible. Um, but in that, I want to make sure that you're eating certain things every day. So the big thing I see when people go from either omnivore, vegetarian to vegan is that they just, they assume protein is going to be in there and it's true it is, but mm -hmm. you still have to make an effort. So if you're someone who tells me that you hate tofu, you hate beans, you hate lentils, you might have a difficult time being vegan because uh, those are really important sources of protein um, and they're, they're really the most nutrient dense foods you're getting on your plant based diet. So I encourage everyone. You don't have to eat soy if you don't want to, but beans at least twice a day. Um, I'm also looking for you to still include vegetables. That's the other thing I find is people just assume that you're going to be getting vegetables. And I kind of see some meals where it's just pasta and bread and crackers and, and they just forget that you still have to make an effort. Uh, so vegetables at least twice a day with two to three servings of fruit. And then for calcium, I break down my food guide, which I use in my practice. Um, in terms of calcium rich food. So I don't use a dairy group, I use a calcium food group. So I'm looking at someone to include at least two to three servings of that. In addition, we want to make sure you're getting some healthy plant based fats, which I think we'll talk about, um, as well as supplements. And so the most important supplements are in Canada, especially vitamin D. Sure. Uh, vitamin B12 is a must. And then I also throw in some DHA, um, just because I want to make sure you're getting enough of those essential fats that sometimes are hard to get from flax and chia and hemp. Sure, sure. Very cool. So now, who who could benefit the most from a plant-based diet, like the one you just outlined? Uh, you know. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah, well, I would answer that question with a question and would say who wouldn't benefit from eating plant-based um because i mean there's really no one group or one person or you know there's we don't have like a meat uh meat daily meat requirement sure. so i mean it's you know it's a personal choice for sure and um but there's no one that wouldn't ben benefit from it so when i look at plant-based diets and how i use them there is that prevention piece um, so using myself as an example, I was dealt a really bad hand of, or bad uh, hand of cards in terms of heart disease. So very strong family history, both sides. Sure. Even when I was vegetarian and at a very healthy weight and exercising five days a week, my cholesterol was still bordering on like almost high, which was shocking because I was vegetarian. And so for me, eggs and cheese makes a big difference in terms of my blood cholesterol. Right. So for me, knowing the cards I'm dealt, I kind of look at it as being like, okay, this is something that's really helpful for me. And then in terms of, uh, you know, prevention, we also have treatment. So specific conditions like type 2 diabetes, there's quite a bit of evidence on a low-fat, whole food, plant-based diet being helpful, uh, as well as obesity, um, uh, any kind of metabolic disease there. And the other one we're starting to see grow is inflammation and pain management. So things like rheumatoid arthritis, um, psoriatic arthritis, different variations of arthritis can really benefit um, from eating more whole food plant-based or even plant-centric. Even if you're not 100% there, just making more of your plate whole food plant-based can be a good benefit as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And so are there kind of, you know, some pretty general short-term and long-term benefits that you see when you start a plant-based diet, moving from, say, the typical North American diet? Yeah, so I mean, I would say the further you were from the diet, the probably more um, more noticeable the changes you're going to experience are. Uh, so if you're really kind of that standard American diet or standard Canadian diet, whatever, same thing, um, and then you're adopting kind of more of an unprocessed whole food diet, you're going to feel a lot different. So whether it's placebo effect or people really feel it, I do often have people say, I feel more energized, I'm sleeping better. Um, I feel lighter. So I hear people say that quite a bit. Sure. Um, definite weight loss is one that you can see. So I mean, again, it depends on what stream of vegan you're going. If you're doing the vegan junk food, that's where people say, well, I haven't lost any weight. And you know, it's that more the whole food where you'd see weight loss. And then with the weight loss, often what comes with that is lower cholesterol, lower blood sugar, um, significantly improved blood pressure. And that's both from losing weight. 
Um, but also because when you eat more plant-based, your rates of potassium or your intake of potassium goes way up um, and you're getting, and that helps to lower your blood pressure. Um, and then with the inflammation is a, is a pretty big one as well in terms of pain management. So I definitely, you know, work with people with fibromyalgia as well or have really terrible backs and we talk about removing some processed food, eating more plant-based. And that's kind of the, the biggest kind of hooker that gets people is that, when they feel better, when they don't have pain, that they want to keep doing what they're doing. Very interesting. So mm -hmm. this is not the typical diet people are used to eating. So I imagine well, among the patients you see and people in general, like what are the biggest challenges that come up when you're transitioning mm -hmm. to eating this way for, on a long-term basis? Definitely, yeah. I would say you know, the biggest challenge I think people have is, is the mindset and probably more of the things not even uh, – related to, uh, uh, not even related to, um, nutrition. Um, so I, I know a lot of people when they think about their, their typical supper, they're thinking of the protein and maybe the starch and maybe then the vegetable. So it's really hard when you take that meat away to figure out, well, what goes there? So it's kind of a new way of thinking about food. Um, because, you know, your protein and your carbs and everything's combined into one. So it also makes it a lot easier because I'm a huge fan of, like, the one-pot meals. Um, so I would say people's mindset and also the support is a big one. Um, definitely where I see, too, is some of the struggles about maintaining is if you're not supplementing well, if you're thinking that you can get everything from your food, which is not entirely true, mm -hmm. um, you could run into issues with B12 or vitamin D um, as well. And then just not having that balance. So if you're eating, you know, kind of, you know, a junky standard American diet, and then you try to do the same thing as a vegan, you're not necessarily going to get the benefits and all of the, um, um, all of the health promoting, uh, effects of eating more plant-based. Sure. So, so those are, I would say are the biggest ones that I see. And some of the ones that even myself has been a challenge uh, you know, in a household, if one person's vegan, one's not, the tension can kind of be there. So uh, definitely that can be uh, a battle to, to deal with. Definitely. Yeah, you need, this, you need the support network to make such a big life change for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So you, you kind of, you hinted at B12, um, yes. but what are some of the other nutrients that uh, plant-based diets are most often deficient in? And what are the best ways to kind of get those, whether, yeah. be, whether that be through food or supplementation? Yep. So uh, the first one I want to talk about being in Canada is vitamin D. Right. And that one's not a vegan issue. That one is, yeah. you. we live in Canada, we get winters, it's awesome to snowboard, um, but we're just not making any vitamin D. And even then, you know, in, in countries that are closer to the equator where you're more likely to get sun and you don't get snow, mm -hmm. even then, depending on if you're wearing sunscreen, smog, um, cloud coverage, um, skin pigmentation, all of that can actually impact how well you are able to absorb vitamin D from the sun. Um, so if you've never gotten your vitamin D levels checked, I highly recommend it. Um, but that's one I'll supplement across the board for everyone, but vegans as well. And there is no good food source of vitamin D, not a reliable kind of common good food source. Um, so that one definitely want people to supplement with. Um, the other one is B12. And I think most people know that when you go vegan, you need to take B12. And there's that myth that, or, you know, you'll see it on the internet and in threads that you can get B12 from chlorella or spirulina or some algae. And the problem with that is the B12 that's found in those is actually inactive. So it looks like B12, but it doesn't act like B12. And when you eat those foods, your body's going to preferentially use inactive, the inactive ones versus the active one. So it can actually lead to a deficiency um, but even though you, you don't know because it looks like you have enough B12. See, that one's, um, really, that one's actually really interesting because you said yeah. something the other day. So, uh, uh, my, my, my wife is, uh, she tries to be vegan most of the time. Oh. We look at, uh, nutritional yeast to, yeah. for, for B12, but you said something the other day that blew my mind, you know, yeah. the, about nutritional yeast. If you want to share that, that'd be great. Yeah. So, so nutritional yeast, the B12 in that can be destroyed by light. Um, so it's not a reliable source. Great. So for everyone, I'm recommending that you don't go to food alone. Supplement, supplement, supplement. Um, I mean, in, in nutritional yeast, it's helpful. Um, you'll get some, but even if it depends where you're getting it, if you're getting it from a bulk store, I mean, 
if it's not fortified, so some is fortified, some's not, it's easy to mix them up. Um, there's no light protection in those stores either. So, and the problem is with B12 deficiency is if it goes long term, and so some of the signs of deficiency can be like cognitive changes, um, your tongue can taste different, uh, you, have, you have numbness in your fingers and joints, and those can be permanent. So I'm very strict with people I see about B12 that you must take a supplement. And what's, the best, gonna, what's the best yeah, form of, Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. What, what's the best form of supplementation for B12? Honestly, it doesn't really matter. Um, in order to absorb it the best, like people ask, should I take it under the tongue or liquid form? Probably liquid would actually be the best, but chewing it is better than actually the sublingual ones that you put under your tongue because okay. um, you want to make sure you destroy it. And I should also say that certain people don't absorb B12. Um, that it doesn't matter if you're getting it from food, if you're an omnivore or if you're vegan and supplementing, in certain people, you're just not going to get enough B12. And so in those people, if you're still noticing it's low, you have to do the injections. Oh, so man. blood work every six to 12 months is pretty important for most people. Um, you know, just to make sure that everything's in balance and that you're feeling okay. But you'll know when your body starts to feel out of whack as well. You'll feel a B12 deficiency. Fair enough. I feel like I need to go visit my doctor now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, wow. Okay. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. I didn't, I had yeah. no idea that there was that much involved in, in actually managing your B12. So that, that's, that's pretty helpful. Um, yeah. so now you mentioned, uh, you know, the differences. So B12 is coming from the, the animal pro protein and everything like yes. that. And so what I'm really curious about is what are the major differences between animal protein and plant protein and yeah. how does that affects things on, on this type of diet? Okay, so I'll try to take an objective stance with answering this question. Controversy. Uh, so, I mean, at a nutritional level, animal protein is, is most similar to human protein in the sense that all of the amino acids that you're finding in animal protein are in similar amounts for human protein. So, it's, you're getting everything you need from there. Um, but you know, the myth that, that plant protein is incomplete protein is still very pervasive. And the thing is any protein source on a plant-based diet is going to have all the essential amino acids in some amount, but one or two of them are just going to be a little bit low. And typically it's lysine and methionine. So if you're tracking on chronometer, you can usually see that it's the lysine is going to be the lowest one because it's possible for you to get enough protein, but to still not be meeting your lysine requirements. Um, so that's kind of, you know, at the core of the nutritional difference, but on a plant-based diet, if you're just A, getting enough calories and B, eating beans, lentils, legumes at least twice a day, it's very, very rare that you would not be getting all of the amino acids you need. Um, so the other difference is when we look at all sources of plant-based protein, they all come with fiber. And that's something that I'm always talking about, pushing. Dietitians love to talk about fiber because it does a lot of really important beneficial things for our health system. Um, one of the, uh, the biggest things about fiber is changing your gut microbiome, so causing good bacteria to grow and kind of, uh, um, I guess, getting out the bad bacteria, crowding out the bad bacteria. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of nutritionally speaking. From a health standpoint, uh, when we look at certain meats, so specifically red meat or um, the processed deli meats, what we know about them is that they're increasingly being linked to an increased risk of certain types of cancer, um, as well as diabetes. And you can also look at things like Alzheimer's and, and animal protein and even dairy is very inflammatory as well. And kind of going back to that gut microbiome comparison as well, what we know is when, if we put someone on a vegan diet or a whole food plant-based diet for even a week, the bacteria that live in their gut will change significantly um, because the, the good bacteria are going to grow because you're giving them so much more food to eat as a result. So, so I think that's kind of, you know, more in a nutshell, nutritionally and health speaking, the differences you're going to see between the two of them. Got it. Yeah. And, you know, I read this on the internet about three years ago, so it must be true. Uh, okay, and that is... And that, and that is the um, that plant-based protein actually is not absorbed as uh, as readily as animal-based protein. Is that true? That yeah, you know, that's true. Yeah, right. it, it definitely is true. I don't see it as being necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, with that, usually what I do is I'll look at how the protein requirements, which 
for which are calculated at 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. So usually what I do is times that about by 10% because it's only about a 10% difference. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, you aren't going to absorb plant protein as well as animal protein, but is that going to have any clinical significance? Studies show no. So yeah, so you read something true on the internet. So that's uh, pretty cool. (laughs) It was three years ago, so you know it was before all the all the fake news. Fair enough, yeah, <laughs> fake news. Fair enough. So uh, let's see, what's that? what do we got next? Um, so uh, let's see, what? Oh yeah, so now, so we talked about protein. Let's move on to fats because I, you know, again, I only am, you know, tangentially involved with a plant based diet, and you know, there are debates about what oils, how to get your fats, and all that kind of stuff. I'd love to understand that better if you have an opinion. I have an opinion, but I don't have all the answers. So that's a studying nutrition is by far the absolute most difficult thing to do. Um, you know, because when you're studying, let's say, a drug, you put one person on the drug, you put one person not on the drug, and you compare the difference. Mm-hmm. When it comes to diet, you're looking at how an individual's genetics, you're looking at activity, you're looking at how these foods interact with each other and within that person's body. And it's very expensive to, to control people's diet for a long, long time. So you get these little studies that you can't draw conclusions from. So I always warn people to be careful if you just read a study because one nutrition study doesn't mean anything. You have to look at an entire body of research. So the whole oil uh, debate goes on a lot in the plant-based community because uh, there's that whole food plant-based, no oils, kind of like comma, no oil is the next step. Um, so I mean, what I do is I look at the epidemiological research, which is basically like observation type of research. Mm-hmm. And what has been shown is people who have heart disease, so well-established coronary artery disease, um, that eating a lot of oil could change the function of their arteries in a negative way. So my approach is very prudent. I say, you know, if you're established, you have or you have very established heart disease, that there's an illness we're trying to manage probably beneficial not to overdo it on the oil Um, and I treat oil on an as-needed basis so really most of the time we don't need to add oil because it's also very calorie dense so if someone's trying to lose weight you know just simply reducing your calories can help that the one place I don't want to use oil is in cooking because cooking can does change the structure of it so it makes the um the what's in it a little more unstable where it could damage your cells and it's um, can have negative health health outcomes. Um, so with oil, so I mean, you know, in cooking, I, I encourage people to use broth to cook right. uh, their vegetables in broth or in water, and to only use it if you really need it. So, for example, a pastry brush can just be used to add a tiny bit of oil if you need. Um, so that's with oil, but I mean, definitely, it's not eating low fat. I don't encourage, or I don't say you need to eat low fat as a result. So I. I definitely want people to get a lot of fat, and I want it from whole food sources. So things that I encourage are omega-3, like plant-based omega-3 would be flax, chia, and hemp seed, um, as well as walnuts would give you some of that ALA that gets converted into that DHA, um, as well as avocados, nuts and seeds, and nut butters. So, so even if you're going low oil, it doesn't mean you necessarily need to go low fat. Um, Because I don't really think that there needs to be such a debate about carbs versus protein versus fat. Like most dietitians I know that I work with, we don't care about macros at all because they don't they don't mean anything to us unless we know a how many calories you're getting and b what your nutrient requirements are. So to be honest, I don't really care what macros someone's eating as long as they're a getting their calorie requirements met, so not going too much in one direction or the other. And they're meeting all their mineral needs. So if you want to do 80, 10, 10 and you're meeting everything, then whatever. It's totally fine with me. Yeah, we've, 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 been, we've been brainwashed on macros these days, I think. Oh, yeah. such a buzzword. Totally. It's totally. buzzword with not a lot of substance <laughs> behind it, to be honest. Yeah, it's too bad. It's too yeah. bad. So um, now a large portion of – so this, is, this might be a, a difficult question because oh, yeah. – uh, but most of, a lot a good portion of our users of on chronometer are actually do, using it for a ketogenic diet which is yeah, obviously yeah. low low carb uh, high fat yeah. and yeah. uh you know i've entertained the idea of doing some kind of plant based if i were to go plant based i i'd, sure. I'd want to do a ketogenic diet cuz i love the health benefits from that diet is yeah. there it seems like the the food list would be way too restrictive uh is there any is it possible is it, can you actually get it done 
Uh, I've heard, so I've heard individually from a couple of people that say they've done it and, you know, they're testing their urine or using breast strips and they say that they're still in ketosis. So from that standpoint, I think it's, it's possible to have the labels that mm. you can be ketogenic and vegan, um, but are you going to be healthy? I don't know. So, I mean, the th- my, my short answer would be no, because I, I don't think there's any way you could get all your vitamins and mineral requirements, all your, your nutrient requirements met without taking all these supplements. Yeah. And to me, I always look at a diet and I say, you know, if you have to supplement a ton of nutrients, then the quality of your diet's not very good. So I don't, I don't like throwing in all these, well, let's add in this and let's add in this. It's, you know, other than B12 and, and D, I don't think there's a lot of need for other supplements. So, I mean, it's, it's, yes, it's possible. Is it healthy to do long term? That's the other thing is I, I think there's just a big question mark. So, sure. I mean, definitely if you want to be your own guinea pig and, or, you know, and let us know how it goes, that's something we could, you know, diarize and follow you on your like day one of the journey and, uh, and find out. But I, I think that, you know, and I would say whatever diet works for you, if someone's doing it and rocking it and loving life and they feel awesome and health is great, then all the power to them. I think that's fantastic. But, uh, you know, from a practice standpoint and, you know, would I put my dietitian stamp of approval on it? Likely not. Uh, until I see, you know, that research and I see that someone can do it and be healthy and really enjoy their lives too and enjoy what they're eating. Well, I'm not on the fence anymore. I think I'll I think I'll let it pass. Okay. So okay, yeah, fair enough. So yeah, so now, like you said, there are a lot of special considerations for this diet. Um, you know, and while not everybody might have a health condition, um, you know, I'm wondering if there are any special considerations for women who are pregnant, um, and and going through something like that. If there are any things they need to consider if they are, you know, eating a plant based diet. Sure. Yeah. So. Uh, I work a lot with the uh, vegan, pregnant vegan women. I uh, just had a best friend that uh, had a little vegan baby, so it was very exciting to, to see her go through that. Um, so the biggest thing to know if you're pregnant and you're vegan or you want to be vegan and you're pregnant is that your needs don't really change in terms of pregnancy. You just need more of everything. So the way I break down pregnancy is calories, protein, nutrients, and things to avoid. Um, so calories... You don't need to be eating for two. Uh, first trimester, you don't even need any more calories. You can just eat the way you're eating. In the second and third trimester, you're adding in a second snack or one additional snack and kind of a mini meal in the third trimester, kind of respectfully. Um, protein where is where it can be a little bit challenging. So as I said, I usually, my kind of general recommendation is one gram of protein per kilogram of body weight. Um, so most women will just say are around like 60 grams is what I might recommend. Mm-hmm. But then in the second and third trimester, that's going to increase by 25 grams. Okay. And that can be difficult for women to meet, especially if they're dealing with any of the fun pregnancy stuff like nausea or vomiting or food aversions. Um, so with a lot of pregnant women, I will suggest a protein powder. Um, but because we have to be careful about certain additives, the only one I'll support is like a hemp, uh, based protein powder because it's very minimally processed. There's nothing added to it. Um, fat wise, carb wise, everything else is good to go. Uh, nutrients, nothing really changes for vegans. You still need B12. You still need vitamin D. You just need a little bit more. Um, but the one you have to make sure you're taking is DHA. And that's kind of a longer chain omega-3 fat that we get a little bit of from flax and chia, but not enough. Um, So that one's really important because babies' gray matter, like their brain, um, is all made from DHA. So DHA is really important for eye health as well. There are some suggestions that your baby could be smarter, I don't know, um, with taking omega-3. So that one I definitely want women to take 200 to 300 milligrams a day. And things to avoid are not that different from, um, you know, omnivore women. Alcohol we want to avoid. Caffeine you can have, but just one to two cups of coffee a day. But you don't want to have any unpasteurized apple cid- or apple cider vinegar, um, no raw sprouts, um, and no homebrew kombucha. And the reason is because in pregnancy, your immune system goes down, and we don't want you to get sick because you have less of an ability to fight an illness should you get sick. Got it. Um, 
Yeah, so those are kind of in a nutshell, uh, you know, some of the things that I would focus on, but I know we're going to go into a lot more detail in future blog posts about yeah. how to use chronometer and how to track for pregnancy as well. Yep, totally. Now, once you, once you actually have those kids and they start growing up and, you know, you get to control their diet, their, you know, for the first uh, parts of their lives, yeah. if they were to eat, a, you know, a successful plant-based diet as children, like, what does that look like? Yeah. Is it possible? So the one thing, the first message I'll give to parents is, you know, because a lot of parents adopt a vegan diet to improve their health, to prevent mm -hmm. disease, and those are the health priorities for kids. Health priorities for kids are growth and development. And so sometimes what can happen on a vegan diet is, so it's naturally lower in calories and there's a ton of fiber. Those two things can make it so kids don't have much of an appetite. Um, so I actually do for kids, especially younger kids, don't want a ton of fiber. So I'm totally okay with some white rice, white pasta, oatmeal is actually not that high in fiber, um, white pita, giving them some more energy density foods with less, um, with less fiber in it. Um, fats should absolutely not be restricted. Kids need a lot of fat to grow. Right. Um, they have higher needs than adults. So fats should never be restricted in, in babies or kids diets. Um, protein needs are actually pretty small. Kids, you know, even if they're eating a little bit of beans, just because they don't need a lot, it's per body weight. Um, kids usually have no problem getting protein needs met. Um, but definitely same supplements are needed, B12, vitamin D, um, maybe a little bit of DHA thrown in as well. So just in smaller doses. Um, the one thing I'll mention too is, you know, when you're transitioning from that point of, you know, breastfeeding to introducing solids, that's really where you want to introduce a lot of iron-rich plant-based foods because um, baby stores tend to run out of iron around six months. So first foods for babies should actually be like, um, mashed beans or pureed lentils are, are my go-to recommendation is get them on beans from a young age and get them full of, of things rich in iron. Very good. Very good. Yeah. yeah I remember the, the, you know, little jars of the, the green Gerber baby, you know, yeah. stuff. It doesn't look that appetizing, but if it's healthy, no. I suppose it's all and right. And you know what? Even for omnivore parents, it's very low in nutrition. So I'm really not a fan of using those jarred baby foods for any kid. Oh. Um, even if you're going to use them in a pinch, they should always be added to. So if hmm. your baby's still breastfeeding, you should be adding breast milk into it. Or adding like, you know, I always say like puree lentils are my absolute favorite for babies because you can add them into anything or mashing an avocado into something because they're very, it's almost like kind of baby junk foods. So stick wow. to giving them whole foods and real foods rather yeah. than store-bought uh, baby products. Oh, man. Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Uh, so these are so we have a couple questions from our users, and some of these you know we've adapted um, as I, as I've asked them. But um, I'm, one of our users was curious about what are the what are the best foods to build immunity for all seasonal illnesses that can be caught in uh, daycare, as a matter of fact. So obviously, yes. little children are full of germs, and uh, we need to protect ourselves from them. So number one is to hand washing is going to go really, really far and proper hygiene. So no food is going to replace just a good hand washing or using a Kleenex. Uh, so that's number one. And so a plant-based diet is actually an anti-inflammatory diet or is a diet that's going to stimulate your immune system. Um, so just kind of talking about supplements first, vitamin D is probably one of the most important nutrients we need in our diet. Uh, vitamin D has roles in so many things more than just bone health. Uh, so vitamin D is very, very important for immune system. So a lot of, so kids at, at age one year, they have the exact same vitamin D needs as a full grown adult. So kids absolutely need to make sure they're getting enough vitamin D to make sure they're building that strong immune system. Um, so beyond that though, we want to focus on nutrient rich foods that have vitamins A, vitamins E, vitamin C. Uh, those are some of the antioxidant uh, nutrients. So what you're going to find those are in brightly colored fruits and vegetables. So whenever I say vitamin A, people usually think of carrots. So anything really orange is going to have a lot of vitamin A. Um, vitamin C is just, it's impossible not to get enough vitamin C eating plant-based. I tell people like you have to work at getting a vitamin C deficiency because um, it's just in everything. 
Um, and then vitamin E is one I sometimes see missing in both vegans and omnivore diets if you're not eating a lot of nuts and seeds. Um, so I mean, oils will have some vitamin E, but not a ton. So mm -hmm. almonds are a really, really good source of vitamin E and very, very good for um, giving you a good dose of, of antioxidants that support immune system. Um, but then even omega-3 uh, is really important too because that's our anti-inflammatory as well. Very cool. Now, if you're incorporating a, a good amount of nuts and seeds into your diet, which you probably should be if you're on a plant-based diet, uh, do you right. recommend soaking them? Yep. Yeah. Do you recommend soaking the, the nuts for how long about, you think? Like soaking them? Yeah, soaking them to... Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. So yeah, so when you, um, so there's something in plant-based food called phytic acid, mm -hmm. which a lot of, you know, if someone's on the other side of vegan, they'll say, oh, you can't absorb any nutrients because all the phytates and the phytic acid. Yeah. And there's actually some health benefits of having the phytic acid that, you know, just in terms of disease prevention that I won't really delve into that. Mm -hmm. um, but what the phytic acid or phytates will do is they'll prevent you from absorbing zinc and iron really well from foods. Got it. And you can decrease the impact of that phytic acid by soaking your uh, plant-based sources of protein by fermenting. So an example would be like a natto, which is a fermented soy product, mm -hmm. um, by germinating, by sprouting, um, and by roasting. So with nuts, you could soak them. That does definitely um, increase the mineral content of the, the nut yeah. um, without losing too many nutrients because most of the vitamins and minerals in there are, are fat soluble, so they're not going to seep out into the water. Okay. Um, yeah. But with nuts and seeds, I also tell people to buy them just raw and dry roast them. Um, so put them in your on a baking sheet. You don't need oil. You don't need anything. You just stick them in the oven for 10 minutes. And that's really going to increase the iron and zinc content. Uh, or not increase it. It doesn't get higher. It just makes it more absorbable oh, versus something that's um, yeah. uh, raw. That's really interesting, yeah, because my understanding was you, you need to soak the nuts in order to kind of get, get, get the phytic acid out in order to absorb the nutrients. But it's only really relevant to zinc and uh, – what was the other one? Iron, yeah. Zinc and iron, the right. Yes, yeah. Cool. So the right. yeah, it's only the minerals. It's anything kind of with like a two plus charge. If you think back to, to science class, uh, the vitamin E is a fat soluble. <laughs> vitamin E is yeah. a fat soluble nutrient. So you, so you're gonna absorb that one pretty well. Um, as long as you you know it, it gets carried with fat, and there's a lot of fat in the nut, so it's it's pretty easy to absorb that one. Yeah, I think I skipped organic chemistry. Um, in oh, college. Yeah. that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds riveting. <laughs> so uh, now I'm actually really curious. So in part, so part of you know transitioning over to a plant based diet, you need to know what to eat. So I'm actually really curious what some of your favorite foods are, favorite recipes. Like that, yeah. Are. I, so yeah, I'm lucky in the city I live in, it seems like there's a new vegan restaurant opening like every month. Um, so I have no limitations here in terms, I mean, there's two vegan, like pure vegan bakeries in Ottawa. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. But, but again, that's kind of going the other route where we want to go more whole foods. That's my 20%. Um, I would say, so my favorite food is probably actually seitan. I don't know if you've ever heard of seitan before. Uh, is that the, uh, the, is it fermented? Uh, no. So no? it's wheat gluten. It's the vital wheat gluten. Oh, no. Yeah. So I'm, I'm all about gluten and that can be another uh, discussion. Oh yeah. You're gonna uh, get some, th it something basically in the comes in, <laughs> it's just pure gluten and you, you can make it into anything you want. So it, it has almost, you know, if you're missing meat, which is weird because I never liked meat, but it has almost like this chewy texture. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm obsessed with uh, seitan is my absolute favorite. Um, I also really love a good vegan burger and not the, the faker meat burgers. I love sweet potato black bean burgers. Um, cashew mac and cheese with uh, tofu is probably one of our favorite go-tos. Um, and then I love bowls. So I love doing, I love one, so once you get your head out of the, I need three things at a meal, into, I can throw everything into a bowl and it will take me like five minutes to assemble, your life is just going to change. Like I have like supper ready. You know, because there's just like some leftover rice or some sweet potato. I've got some beans in there. Nice. And you just throw it all together. And tahini is like the secret weapon. Because you can make so many different sauces using tahini and nutritional yeast and doing either sweet or savory. 
Um, so I do a lot of bowls as well because I I don't love cooking to be honest, and uh, but it's it's super good and super nutrient dense as well. Very cool. Now this may be a silly question, but I assume uh, people with uh, gluten sensitivity can't really uh, they, it, it wouldn't work. Seeding wouldn't work then, huh? Don't eat seitan <laughs> if you have any issues with gluten. I've got a stomach of steel, so I can uh, I can eat as much seitan as I as I want. But it's it's really I like the I like the vegan food where it's not already trying to taste like something else, where yeah. you can make it your own thing. So, um, you know, I don't actually make it; I make my husband make it. Uh, but he does a fantastic job of doing like a barbecue seitan, um, and it's so it's actually insanely high in protein. So anything really high in protein, you can eat a lot of. And whenever you sit down and eat seitan, you know you've eaten seitan because it's just so filling that you can't yeah. overeat. And it's not that high in calories uh, either. It's just pure protein. Interesting. Yeah, I have I have seen on on you know a vegan restaurant here and there like bacon flavored uh, seitan or whatever it is. Okay. <laughs> All right, have to get it. Let me know how it tastes in there. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, uh, let's see. So then, uh, so for those of us who don't, I, we don't have a lot of. We have one vegan restaurant where I'm from uh, in uh, Orlando at the moment. Um, there's a few others that are popping up that I haven't tried yet, yeah. but I'm not crazy impressed with what we have available. So, are there any uh, you know res uh, resources or recipe books yeah. that you might you know, uh, recommend to people like me? For sure, yeah. So one thing vegans love to do is, is talk about being vegan, um, but also uh, talk about the food we eat. We love to talk about, first we say we're vegan, and then we say, look at what I ate. Uh, just, I don't know, I think we're always trying to prove, prove ourselves. So I mean, it's fine, it's good to laugh at yourself. Sure. Um, but yeah, so I mean, if you're lost at what to go, flip on the internet, I guarantee you can find like like we can do bacon out of coconut, out of eggplant, out of tempeh. Like we have all different versions of coconut bacon, or sorry, just vegan bacon. Um, but so some of my favorite recipe sites. So I kind of already mentioned I don't love to cook. Um, I do it because I love to eat, uh, and because I, you know, I need to live and all of that. Um, but Minimalist Baker is probably my favorite go-to chef because her thing is like 10 ingredients or less, one bowl or less, or 30 minutes or less. Right. Um, so she's kind of a favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Canada, Oshi oh, Glows is really big. She's based out of Toronto and um, so you might have even heard of her. She's pretty big. Uh, so she's a really good cookbook. Uh, hers are a little more time intensive, but definitely worth the effort. Uh, there's also a really cool app and website called Finding Vegan. Um, and what this is, is bloggers can submit what they've made. And so you can search different categories. You can search. Um, so if you're looking for some sort of specific vegan dessert, you can search for it. Uh, it's all picture based. So when I can't sleep, I tend to just scroll through and look at uh, food pictures. Uh, so that's probably another really, really favorite one of mine. Uh, but usually between Minimalist Baker and Oshi Glows, you're going to find some things you you really like. And it's and they're so different because, you know, everyone knows how to cook meat or, you know, there's only so many things I feel like you can do. But when you start looking at beans and lentils and all the crazy things vegans do to them, like we make, we make whipped cream out of chickpea water. Um, so, I mean, like, it gets pretty wow, insane, yeah. some of the recipes. Yeah, it's called aquafaba. It's amazing. And it's That's just one can of chickpea water, a little bit of sugar, um, and you just whip it up, and it's amazing. Wow, I, yeah, I haven't heard of that one before. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So, now, I obviously want to learn more about a plant-based diet now. So, where cool. should I go? Where should I go to learn more? What are some of the some books you might recommend or resources, yeah. you know, that are available? Yeah, so I'm, I like some of my fellow dietitians for resources. If you're looking for really good nutrition information that is backed by law science, that's not going to, you know, be too fanatical or too just opinion based, um, Becoming Vegan is by far the best book I could recommend. So it's written by Brenda Davis and Vicento Molina. So they're also Canadian. So uh, they get that stamp behind them too. Uh, Jack Norris is fantastic as well. He has a book called Vegan for Life. Um, and he also ha runs a fantastic, very science-based website called veganhealth.org. Mm -hmm. And uh, he does a lot of, of looking at research and just giving you straight facts. 
about nutrients, about disease states. So he's a really good one, a little science heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, in terms of some of the physicians, I, I do like Dr. Michael Greger. Um, both his enthusiasm and his videos are pretty, um, you know, quick little snippets um, about some sort of study he read. Again, he tends to do just one study at a time. So what I like is when you can look at his library and see all of the research he's talked about on a certain uh, a certain topic. So, you know, those are kind of, I don't want to overwhelm people with information because sure. it's between those three you're going to get the same type of messaging it's just which one do you kind of want to look at more or who do you who do you like more sure sure cool well you know how can people get in touch with you and you know where can they learn more about what you're doing yeah so um, I'm based in Ottawa I do some international work just kind of starting a little bit uh, so my website susanmcfarlandnutrition.com and uh, see, I also have a Facebook page. I'm on Twitter. And I'm not on. T I'm on Twitter, but I'm not on Twitter. Um, I'm more on Instagram because again, I like to show food. Uh, so I'm at Susan underscore Vegan RD. Um, and then I'm in the the forums on Chronometer as well, wow. chatting with people about uh, what they're eating, trying to give some clarifications totally. about things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, talking aquafaba, whatever, whatever <laughs> comes up, we'll chat about. Awesome. Well, I really want to thank you for taking the time to, you know, talk to me today and, you know, hopefully some people get interested and learn some things that they didn't know before about a plant-based diet. So, really, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Awesome.